by way of internet who have joined us for our Wednesday evening Bible study, 6.30 to 6 to 7, 4, uh, 15. We're grateful that you're here with us. We're going to share and we're going to try to encourage you and encouraging you. We want you to remember what you see and hear and then try, as we all do, to live higher and to live better. That's what our goal is, to live higher and live better. Now we're going to make some mistakes, we're going to have some miscues, we're going to have some faults, but we got to get beyond our faults and let God meet all our needs. Amen? Amen. And that's what God can do. Tonight we're going to look again, and I'm fascinated by this study, and I trust you're still praying for me as God will send me the type of revival we need, not just for the church, but for the community. Not just for us, but for others. And not just about us, but those who are in need and those who help. Amen? Amen. Those who need help. So we're grateful to God, and we're going to look back in the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is going to, we're going to focus on chapter 2 and some of the things that happened there. Because I believe it's exciting. I believe it's uh, mysterious how God can bless you and you have nothing. And then all of a sudden you have something then you have a plan, and then next thing you know, you're doing something you never thought you would do. God is able to do that for us if we will yield ourselves to him. We can't promote ourselves, we can't equip ourselves, and we can't make people uh, support us. But God can make a way out of no way. So we're going to look at Nehemiah just again because there's a, there's a lot to learn from this uh, man of God who was a cupbearer to the king. Uh, he tasted all the food before the food hit uh, the table for the king and drank and spilled the wine before that got to. That was a dangerous job if somebody was out to kill the king. Uh, but more important than that job was Nehemiah seeing the need to go back home and straighten things out. And this is why the mechanics of how do you do, how do you build a wall, how do you get people to support and follow you, and how do you keep the, the strength of, of character and courage to do something God has asked you to do? Because we know how we are. Say amen. amen. At the first sign, somebody said, uh-uh, I ain't going to do it. They didn't do it there. You know how we are. Loud, exclamatory, and negative. And you got to overcome that first hurdle in order to run the race. Amen? you got to overcome that first hurdle. And that first hurdle is people saying, you know, I don't think you can do that. And you know you can't do that. And your own mind, sometimes, you are your own worst enemy. Because you don't need the people around. you got past habits that come back and say, you can't do that. you got old voices that say, you failed when you tried. Others. At this time, it won't be any better. We've got to tell our negative minds and the negative voices to be quiet so we can hear the voice of God. Nehemiah did such a thing, and we're going to follow him as he went back to Jerusalem, and the people were not knowing, uh, not knowledgeable about why he was there, but yet he had a procedure and a plan, and his procedure and plan, to me, parallels how we ought to plan our lives, or to plan our estates, or to plan for our children, or to plan for our grandchildren, or to plan for the things in this lifetime. Nehemiah had a plan. Do you know something? Someone said of God, God had a plan when he created the world. Mm -hmm. And they said he had a plan and he worked his plan. And when God worked his plan, he planned his work and worked his plan and it all came about and on the seventh day he rested. So we need to have a plan and we need to work our plan. But our plan has to come through prayer. Nehemiah's did. Let's open it up now and look to see some of the things. I'm interested in chapter 2 because chapter 2 brings to light the fruition of his prayer. His prayer was, Lord, help us. Our, our city has been, the walls have been torn down, the gates burned with fire, and we are a reproach. And we said reproach meant no one had any respect for you. You were laughing at yourself. Is that right? Yeah. So reproach means you just looked upon with disdain. All right? So now we pick it up. It says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of our taxes is the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. This is 
setting the stage for after you pray, you got to wait on God. After you pray, you can't pick up the problem and try to work it yourself if you ask God to do it. And the hardest thing for us to do is be still. Be still. Be still and let God work it out because we want to get in there. And we want to mess it up. We want to show them how to do it. But God says, be still and know that I'm who? God. Now, in this passage we covered it Sunday, of course, the king noticed Nehemiah's confidence said, and then inquired of him. Nehemiah had an emergency prayer, and he was in fear that the king would uh, actually ex execute him, because you weren't supposed to be sad in the presence of any king, let alone the Persian, the Medo Persian king. Everybody around me, happy. That was the old. Uh, uh, TV series Fantasy Island, some of y'all remember that, yeah. with Mr. Rourke and Tattoo. And he says, smile everybody, smile, then reap the guests. Well, that was just to put on a pasty smile and make him look good. But what God wanted to have us to do is wait on him. And as we wait on him, amen, I learn to allow him to move in his time. Nehemiah waited on the Lord, and the Lord, instead of giving him a smile, gave him a promise. And a smile is just a frown turned upside down. Is that right? He was frowning. And they observed, the king observed him and asked him, and then that's when he said, how can I help but be sad? He had to admit it. And that, was, that took a risk. In other words, you're going to kill me, you kill me. Uh, i got to tell you why I'm saying it. I'm saying because of what is at home. And the king went from having him fear him to favor. How in that split second, he said, well, that's what you want. Am I? Ask, make a real request of me. Uh, I'm a king, I'm fair, make your request. He didn't say I'm okay. So he went from fear to favor, and that was only because the hand of God touched the king, and the king's heart is in the hand of God. Amen. Amen. So now he gives him a laundry list of things he wants. And the king says, no problem. Amen. When God has given you favor with man, man cannot help but grant you the wishes. Amen. If you remember Esther in the next book or so, in Nehemiah, Esther, Esther obviously was dressed up and hadn't been before the king. Uh, 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 yeah, she hadn't been before the king, and the king, she said, you know, if I don't go, if I go before the king and they haven't sent for me, um, either he holds a scepter out or I die. Uh. And so she had fasted and prayed with her handmaidens and she fasted and drank no water and then dressed up beautifully. And she didn't need makeup because they said she didn't need makeup. God said, you don't need makeup, you don't need makeup. She was beautiful. And she decked out and stood there, huh? You know how sisters get sad. I don't want to get all into that. The sister stood there and she saw, and he saw his wife, which she was his wife, and he couldn't help. And the Lord said, huh? If he did, didn't he hell that subject out? Come on up here, baby. Huh? And, and tell that and what you want. Is that right? <laughs> I'll give you up to half my kingdom, huh? The, the, the Lord really knows how to open that king's heart, doesn't he? And through his eyeballs or through his memory or just through a, a, a cold heart. God can work the work. Amen? And so God worked the work for King Artaxerxes and he signed off on all the wood, all the army. He gave him captains, which means more than one captain. He had a strong military contingent with him. He gave him letters to pass through certain areas that you wouldn't go in that province unless the king authorized you. So Nehemiah got the wood, crossed over the river, and then started going some uh, 300 miles back home. 300 miles back home. And he had a contingent of army with him. So he gets back home, and now the people are looking, what in the world is all of this? This man coming. He said, I didn't tell him anything. I didn't tell him anything. The first three nights I was there, I didn't tell him nothing. In the old days when you came in uh, to the country, you come loaded down in a car. Somebody remember that? And everybody would look, y'all got guests, huh? In the country, everybody knew you were a guest because they knew you didn't belong around. They knew Nehemiah was a guest, and they said, oh, at least he had come home. And they said, what in the world is he doing? And he said, for three days, I didn't tell him nothing. And then I got up in the evening and took this donkey, the beast, and I went out one of the, the water gate. I went out through the sheep gate. I went by the dung gate. I went through all these gates, and there was no place for my beast to pass, so I returned back to the water gate. In other words, he said, I surveyed the wall. 
I surveyed the situation. What are you saying? We're passing through a situation called a process of how do you work for the Lord. You work for the Lord by inviting him to come into your situation. Amen, amen. And then you go about looking and seeing what needs to be done. God gave you two eyes. He gave you a mind. Some things you can look and see what needs to be done without somebody telling And Nehemiah, not only did he have the resources now, and he had the prayer power, but now he would have the planning power and the administration. What are you saying, Reverend? He said after the third day, he called all the people together and said, let me tell you something. I want to tell you something because I need to tell you this in order to solicit your support for doing what we're going to do. I have a vision. That's the first thing a leader has to have. A leader has to be inspired enough to have a vision. Then a leader has to be resourceful enough to know how he's going to bring his vision to fruition. And that's why God comes in. Everything you may not know, but if you give it to God, he will put it in your heart and in your hand. Nehemiah had the resources, now he would solicit the people, and the way he would solicit the people was telling them, God's hand has already been good toward me. I was the king's cupbearer, and I had the audacity to be sad in front of the king. And when I was sad, instead of the king killing me, he found, gave me favor. And all that you saw, all those camels out there, all those military men, they have given us the opportunity to build for ourselves. And therefore, I want you to know, God has already given you favor. Now, who's ready to build? Right. See, that's the kind of way you got to inspire people. Amen. you got to show the credit of faith and prayer, and then you got to tell them, God has given you this moment. What will you do with this moment? Amen. And the Bible will say in chapter 2, the people had a heart to build. Amen? And you know what makes us strong is when we dig deep down in our soul and say, I can do this, I can do that. And there were 32 groups that Nehemiah delegated authority and put them on the wall. So here's how they look. You got group number one. Let me see if we can go to this. And that was those priests who were going to work on the gate. The keys. He said, y'all got some lumber? So yeah, we went by ASAP's uh, forest. And Asaph gave us beams, that was his name. And Asaph gave us all the beams. If y'all want to work on the, on the gates, y'all work on the gates. We're going to work on the gates. Then they said, we're going to argue this here. We're going to work on the wall. We're going to work on the door of the gate from the wall. And we're going to line that up. And then you got all these people. And you go through it on chapter 2 and 3. And you see all these people lining up families saying, we'll do this part. We'll do this part. We'll do this part. Now, what if the church started by yeah. What could we do for our community mm -hmm. if we lined up in unity mm -hmm. and looked like we were doing something together? Right. Churches are just people saying, Reverend, I'll do this, I'll do that. You know when you line up in the will of God, in the word of God, and in the work of God, that really validates who you are. Right. You come alive. The people who are getting old are the people who rust out. The people who are still vibrant are the people who work out. Y'all better hear me. You can rust out by looking at TV. You can work out by getting you a vegetable garden and growing something you can share with your people. Amen. You can work out by doing things to help others. So what we have is the fact that Nehemiah delegated to those young, to those people who were in Jerusalem. You do this section, you do this section, you do this section, and they got started on working together. Mm -hmm. Do you know there is cohesiveness in working on the same vision? Mm -hmm. They accepted the vision of Nehemiah, and nobody came in with a different vision. Well, I don't think the wall ought to look like that. I think it ought to have flowers and cherries and all that. Mm -hmm. I said, listen, Knucklehead, we got to keep the enemy out. There's only one way this wall can be, high, tall, thick, and strong. Yeah. And that's the way God gave it to me. So he didn't have people try to disrupt, disrupt the plan of God. Huh? Some disruptors, and that means you got some Negroes, who can make you mad just by telling them what you're going to do. But these people, what did I say, had a what? Heart to work for God. So instead of tearing up the thing, instead of, they were individuals, but as a group, they were a team. 
They were individuals who could have had their own idea, but they decided to encourage one another. So the way they encouraged one another was, you gonna do that? I'm gonna help you. You gonna do that? I'm gonna help you. And that's what made the team work. We don't have that in San Antonio Spur, man. I was saying Kawhi Leonard wants to nobly and Parker to go to another team. I read that today. I don't believe he would do that. I believe he has a crazy uncle who's trying to negotiate. Ain't never negotiated before. Got a big mouth and don't know what to do. So he's going to tear up the boy's career because he want to put one on pop. I believe the boy will come back and play. I believe this is for 219 million. I play. Uh, Give me the ball. I play. Yeah. <laughs> what are you saying, Robert? We do more self destruction when we turn it over to people who don't know what they're doing, never done it before, and have no view of how a team really looks. A team is not one person. You spell team with everything T E A M. There's no I. Amen. So Nehemiah got people who had a mind to work. Mm -hmm. Then he had people who would collaborate and draw skills, and then they would encourage one another. Mm -hmm. How would the church look if we decided to beautify this corner yeah. beyond measure? Yeah. And everybody said, I'll chip in. I'll chip in this. I'll do this, and I'll do that. When you do that, now I got a team. I got somebody I can say, now, hey, hey, and I'm ready to hand that ball off, and we're going to go somewhere, baby. Everybody's going to move out. Okay. That's what a team looks like. And when everybody's going opposite ways in a different way, they're disjointed. But they took that wall, and when they got busy on it and started working it, and then the dynamic of it, the success of one changed over to the dynamic of two, and the dynamic of three, and the dynamic of four, so they can say, look at what we are doing. Not what I did, but look at what we can do. And when they saw what they could do, they 52 weeks, they finished that wall. They were building rascals. They built that wall because the Spirit of God inspired them to be a team. They built that wall because the man of God had a vision. They built that wall because he brought delegation of authority. He could not do it all himself. And then they gutted it out. That's what the old coaches used to say back in the 60s. You got to gut it out. What does that mean? That means you got to give it all your own. Yeah. And he said, everybody's tired. That's what the old coaches were. Uh -huh. In my next life, I'm going to be a coach. Anyway. <laughs> said, in the fourth quarter, everybody's tired. Now you got to get want it a little more. You got to do it just a little more. And you got to break through that line and you got to get those points. Now, coach, you can tell somebody, there is nothing in Christianity that inspires us to that level. We say, how are you doing? Going up, praise the Lord. Huh? We don't have nothing that makes us gun it out and say, I'm going to do it for the Lord. And I'm going to take my last dollar. If I have to, yeah. out of my own pocket, yeah. come on yeah. somebody. Amen. And I'm going to give it, and we're going to make this thing work. Yes. Yeah. Now let me show you what it's like to get it out. I've asked Brother Bartita to show this little film of an African lady running a marathon. And she's an older lady. She doesn't even look old. And she's run, I believe, on several continents. But she came to, I believe, Austin to run in the 2015 Austin Marathon. And she was running her best, Lord Jesus, until she gave out. When she gave out, she fell down. When she fell down, she couldn't go, as we say in track, another foot right. on her legs. But like that Jamaican bobsled team, she said, I got a cross. Right. I got a cross to finish line. Even if I got thrown, yeah. right. I got go. Right. And you know that's what Jesus did when he carried the cross. He fell down, but he crawled. And he crawled for you and I. Yeah. Now look at the picture and learn a lesson. Oh, what God yeah. wants this church. Oh,
this land? I have no idea. Mm-hmm. From left to right. Mm-hmm. 
And that inspired me because if we use the Lord in that form, we already know we're victorious. So why stop? Just keep right on going. Amen. 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 You know, when you put something into something and you're trying to finish a project, you're trying to do something good, uh, you put your last in. I remember when we were, my wife and I were at Wheaton Heights, I was youth minister there, and we worked so hard with the young people. We took them on TV, we took them everywhere we could take them, and then we were scheduled to go. We did some work in the uh, yard, and they said, we're going to let y'all go to Corpus. And uh, I wanted them to go to Corpus because I was invited down there to preach at Reverend Branch Church and, uh, at St. John. And so we said, okay, we raised money and washed cars, and we're going, Monday was the business meeting. So we went to the business meeting to see how much they give us, and they said, oh, we already spent that money. I said, overnight, you couldn't have spent that money. No, no. We're not going to do nothing. I'm with the deacon said. So you wonder why sometimes I, I'm the way I am. Anyway, <laughs> I said, you mean to tell me you told us? I said, Reverend told us if we did this, we could go. We, we, we ain't going nowhere. I know. And I said, I promised the kids. You know how we can do that. Okay. Lips like trays and lubies. Mm. Huh? Mm. Put a salad on the and some dessert in our tray. <laughs> anyway, I came home and I said, honey, they not going to let us go or give us the money. I said, I promised those babies. They were young, young people in their high school. That I hate to disappoint. She said, We'll take our vacation money. Mm. The kind of woman I'm having. Yeah. Right. And we're going to buy a rent a bus and we're taking those bands. We're going to get food for them. And we're going to, when they go to Corpus, they're going to sing. Amen. And then after sing, we're going to let them go to the beach. Amen. Amen. I said, That sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> Call them Continental Trailways. Can you be over here? 5 a.m. on Friday morning or whatever morning we were going to go. And uh, it was early Sunday morning. And we drove down on that bus to Corpus. And we sang at St. John Church. And I preached, and it was such a wonderful time. And then I said, Well, this is our vacation. We'll stay over a night, but we'll send the bus back. And the bus, I, the bus driver happened to be somebody I went to school with. And I said, Take them by the beach and show them a nice time. And that's what they did. And uh, we went on and stayed and enjoyed ourselves. Just one night that turned out to be our vacation. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you, I worked so hard. Uh -huh. I love the kids so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when those Negroes said you couldn't go, I said, I'll take my last money right. and put it on my baby because yeah. I'm not going to disappoint you. Yeah. That's what you do yeah. when you love Jesus. You grow. Yes. And you crawl with your last energy. Yes. We don't have nothing that encourages us like looking at that and seeing that's what Christianity encompasses. You're all. You run out of energy, call on Jesus. Yes. You run out of strength, call on Jesus. Yes. And some of them big old trucks got an auxiliary tank so that when the big tank gets on me, you throw that baby into auxiliary and you keep on going. I'm through now. I don't want to I thought I could call you. Anyway, this is what God wants you to do. I'm through now. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to stand and have our prayer. Somebody get me a drink of water. That would be a prophet's pleasure.